Sometimes you're lucky enough to come across someone who performs without egoism, is guided by generosity, and who has no desire to ask for anything in return, and on top of that, leaves a visible mark upon this earth. Well, that someone, in fact, I did come across. It was when I was on a long trip by foot over mountains, quite unknown to tourists, in the ancient and then deserted barren and colourless region where the Alps thrust down into Provence. I had run out of water, so I was hoping there was going to be a spring or a well in the abandoned village that I walked into. It was more like five or six houses, roofless, with all life vanished, the wind growling over the carcasses of the houses like a lion disturbed at its meal. There was a spring, but it was all dried up, so I moved on. After five hours of walking, I still hadn't found any water. All about me was dry, and then I glimpsed in the distance a small silhouette. At first it looked like a trunk of a solitary tree, but walking towards it, it turned out to be a shepherd. He had thirty sheep lying about him on the baking earth. The shepherd kindly gave me a drink from his water bottle, excellent water, which he drew from a very deep natural well near his cottage. He took me there, not a cabin as I had expected, but a real house built of stone. The man spoke little. This is the way of those who live alone. The place was in order, the dishes washed, the floor swept, his rifle oiled, his soup was boiling over the fire. I noticed that all his buttons were firmly sewed on and that his clothing had been mended with the meticulous care that makes the mending invisible. He shared his soup with me. When I offered my tobacco pouch, he told me that he did not smoke. His friendly dog was silent as himself. The shepherd went to fetch a small sack full of acorns and poured them out onto the table. One by one, with great care, he began to inspect them, separating the good from the bad. I smoked my pipe, offered to help. No, no, this was his job. I did not insist. That was the whole of our conversation. When he had selected hundred perfect acorns, he stopped and went to bed. There was peace in being with this man. Next day, before leaving, he plunged his sack of carefully selected acorns in a bucket of water. With an iron rod as thick as my thumb, he began thrusting it into the earth making a hole in which he placed an acorn. Then he filled the hole. He was planting oak trees. I asked him, did the land belong to him? No, no. Did he know whose it was? No, I suppose it is the community property. Or perhaps it belongs to someone who cares nothing about it. He simply carried on planting his hundred acorns with the greatest care. I got him to tell me his name. Elzear Bouffier, and he was fifty-five. He had lost his only son, then his wife, and had now withdrawn into solitude, where his pleasure was to live leisurely with his lambs and his dog. This land was, in his opinion, dying for want of trees, and as he had no pressing business of his own, he had decided to do something about it. For three years he had been planting trees in the wilderness, by now, one hundred thousand. Twenty thousand had sprouted. Of the twenty thousand, he still expected to lose about half to rodents or to the unpredictable designs of providence. Still, there remained ten thousand oak trees to grow where nothing had grown before. I was young and looked upon the future in relation to myself and to a certain quest for happiness, so I said, Ah! Oh, Thirty years, your ten thousand oaks will be magnificent. If God grants me life for another thirty years, I will have planted so many more, and the ten thousand oaks will be like a drop of water in the ocean. I'm studying the reproduction of beech trees. I have a nursery of seedlings grown from beech nuts near my cottage, and I'm also considering birches, for there is moisture a few yards below the surface of the soil. 
The next day we parted, and the following year came the war of 1914, which had me occupied for the next five years. During this time I almost forgot the impression Elzear Bouffier had left on me. I considered it almost as a hobby or a stamp collection, something of the past. But when the war was over I had such a desire to breathe fresh air, and once again I took to the road of the barren lands. I had seen so many men die during these five years that I imagined Elzear Bouffier was dead too. But he was not. As a matter of fact, he was extremely spry. He had changed jobs, and now he had only four sheep, but instead a hundred beehives. The oaks of 1910 were then ten years old and taller than either of us. I was speechless, and as he did not talk, we spent the whole day walking through his forest in silence. In three sections, it measured 11 kilometers at its greatest width. When you remembered that all of this had sprung from the hands and the soul of this one man, without technical resources, I understood that humans can be as effectual as God in other and destruction. He had pursued his plan, and beech trees as high as my shoulder spreading out as far as the eye could reach, confirmed it. Creation seemed to come about in a sort of chain reaction. He did not worry about it. He was determinedly pursuing his task in all its simplicity. As we went back toward the village, I saw water flowing in the brooks. This was the most impressive result of chain reaction that I had ever seen. The wind, too, scattered seeds. As the water reappeared, so reappeared willows, rushes, meadows, gardens, flowers, and a certain purpose in being alive. The transformation took place so gradually that it became part of a pattern without causing any astonishment. That is why no one meddled with Elzear Bouffier's work. If he had been detected, he would have had opposition. One must not forget that he worked in total solitude, so total that at the end of his life he lost his habit of speech, or perhaps it was that he saw no need for it. Peaceful, regular toil, the vigorous mountain air, frugality, and above all serenity of spirit had endowed this old man with awe-inspiring health. He was one of God's athletes. I saw Elzia Bouffier for the last time in June of 1945. He was 87. I had started my route through the wastelands, but hardly recognised the scenes of my earlier journeys. Everything had changed, even the air. Instead of the harsh, dry winds that used to attack me, a gentle breeze laden with scents was blowing. A sound like water came from the mountains, it was the wind in the forest. And in the once abandoned village square, someone had planted a linden tree beside it. It must have been four years old, already in full leaf, a symbol of resurrection. Hope, then, had returned. Ruins had been cleared away, houses restored, 28 inhabitants, four of them young married couples, it was now a village where one wanted to live. People had settled here, bringing youth, motion, the spirit of adventure. And little by little the villages had been rebuilt, and more than 10,000 people owed their happiness to Elzia Bouffier. When I reflect that one man, with his own physical and moral resources, was able to cause this land of Canon to spring from the wasteland, I am convinced that in spite of everything, humanity is admirable. And I am so full of respect for that old and unlearned peasant who was able to complete a work worthy of God. Elzea Bouffier died peacefully in 1947 at the Hospice of Bernon.